My gratitude to Lee and Bev for the music this morning and our orchestra. It's too few players, but they're faithful. You got to give them that. And, and, and you could join them, some of you, you know. <laughs> I also have um, a recognition I want to make this morning. It isn't very often I have the privilege of acknowledging a senior uh, to me, and I get to do that. But he's more than that. He's a friend, he's a colleague, he's a mentor, uh, he's a pastor. When I started ministry in Central California Conference way back when, I know I'm not one of the young guys anymore, um, I started in Clovis Church. And about three, four months into that, Tim Mitchell, who some of you know, he was a uh, 10 years pastor at the Pacific Union College Church, went to our conference president and said, you're going to need to move this young man or you just might lose him. And so sure enough, seven months after being assigned to Clovis, I was assigned to Visalia. And the senior pastor there was Elder Ralph Nidai. Ralph, would you wave at everybody? And Ralph accepted me warmly and got no work out of me right away because within a week of getting there, I met Jill. And within two weeks of getting there, I started dating her. And um, probably the least productive associate pastor on record after that. Um, and married her. And uh, Ralph was the one who performed the wedding ceremony. And uh, you know, we had many good times and laughs and have been friends ever since. And I'm just glad he can be here today. He's headed to the One Project in San Diego later. And so, so am I. And so that, that, that's a wonderful reunion. Glad you're here, Ralph. Thank you. So I wanted to uh, make that acknowledgement before I get too far along today. Just to bring those of you who haven't been around up to speed this January, we've been talking about, initially, just as kind of a gimmick, we talked about uh, living this year before God, with God. But we're really looking at not a year, not a day, not a month. We're looking at a lifetime living with God and knowing Him. And so we thought on the 10th that we might explore what it means to have a little better version of ourselves. Maybe we don't make resolutions. Maybe we don't uh, go into the deep end of, of seeking total transformation in one fell swoop. But we think of finding a better version of ourselves in what we, what we choose, who we are, what we pay attention to, and in our journey with God. On the 17th, we noted the anniversary of the earthquake in Northridge. Many of you remember that and talked about times of quaking in our own life spiritually and how easy it is to get derailed and lose track of our God in times of shaking and trouble. On the 24th, we talked about the anniversary of the gold rush in California or the first find, the El Dorado, and the uh, true fortune that comes to us in seeking God you cannot seek something you don't value. You can't keep a hold of in your mind the worth of a project that's low in priority and value in your estimation. And so when we place God where he belongs as the pearl of great price, the kingdom, the treasure to be sought, uh, we have some basis for seeking and finding. Last week we talked about freedom and how essential that is in the wake of the proclamation of emancipation to leave the lives of slavery that we live to sin and death and move into the house of love and grace and life that Christ has come to give. To experience true freedom in order to truly, again, be free to seek and free to find. Today I'm going some different directions. At the risk of being really pedantic, at the risk of telling you stuff that you just know already, I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about the fact that Jesus is central in our experience and understanding of who God is. When we talk about what it means to be a Christian, we're not just talking about a Christocentric sort of worldview. We're not just talking about um, adherence to a certain set of ethics or principles, 
derived from sacred text and tradition. We're not just talking about membership in a Christian body such as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When we talk about what it means to be Christian, we're talking about what it means to be one who is a disciple of or follower of the way of Jesus. And that's more complicated at first blush than it looks like. Who is this Jesus? And so there's studies that have focused on who is Jesus historically? Who was really the historical Jesus? Studies that have focused on just texts that are considered canonical. Studies that have focused on historical, critical studies, canonical studies, etc., all pulled together in theological ways to try to describe who Christ in God is. I don't have time for all of that today, but what I want us to think a little bit about is the centrality of the claims of Christ in our lives if we're thinking about focusing on a year before God, a year of life, uh, a lifetime of life actually with God. Because if, if Christ isn't at the center of this for us, it's going to be a very difficult journey. And it's going to be a journey that takes us places we don't want to go. If you look at my letter in the bulletin, and I hope you do read those, thank you for the five, six, seven people who texted me or emailed me and said, yep, keep it up, I read this. Um, to those of you, I say thanks. To the rest of you, maybe I'll just read it to you. Second paragraph. When we think of observing faith, it's easy to get caught in the importance of the extraneous. It's beguiling to engage the pseudo-intellectual. You know what I mean by that? How many angels can dance on the head of a pin, that kind of stuff. And sometimes fabrication is more interesting than truth. Religiously, this often happens. We're not immune. We end up imbalanced, hurt, caught in theories that isolate us or others, or in, in, in perfectionistic modes that end up producing unwarranted guilt. We end up with unhealthy religion that doesn't promote healing or wholeness, that neglects justice and or mercy, that becomes so falsely confident it fails to e even to pretense of humility. Jesus is the center of our faith, the hope of our future, the absolute greatest revelation of the Father and the one who has borne firsthand witness of the same. The idea of life with and before God without reference to the centrality of Christ in the salvation story as the one who reveals the truth about the Father is frankly incomprehensible. It's vital in this journey. His story becomes our story. And that last line I must give credit to Smuts Van Royen for, who so ingeniously uh, posited that when the Adventist story becomes God's story, we'll be where God wants us to be. I think there's tremendous power in that. So let's take a look at our texts that we just had read for us today and just try to get a couple of, of images, a couple of windows into this reality that we're trying to get our minds around. And let's just take those for what they are today uh, because we have the rest of the year to talk about the qualities of who God and Christ might be. But let's start with our psalm. This is not particularly a messianic psalm. This isn't necessarily talking about Jesus. But we do note that Jesus was called Lord and this appeal is to Lord God as well. And we note that Christ is with God in the beginning, John chapter 1. We see the Spirit hovering. We get these images of the completeness and fullness of God in Genesis and in John. But when we get to the psalm, we're looking at something that describes Jesus nevertheless. And in fact, we'll see later that he appropriates some of this, appropriates some of this language. I love you, Lord, my strength. Now, I don't know if you have your own Bible. If you have a pew Bible, don't mark it up. If you have your own Bible, you might just want to uh, highlight a few words as you go through this. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to pop some of those words for you. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 
I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The Lord lives, praise be to my rock. Exalted be God my Savior who saves me from my enemies. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. Let's just pop a few of these words. Strength, rock, fortress, deliverer, rock again. We're not talking about sandstone, something soft, something scrapable, something that shatters. We're not talking about shale. We're talking about rock, something firm, something immovable, something hard. In whom I take refuge, something strong. My shield, something that protects. The horn of my salvation. This is an odd uh, phrase that we've come across many times in our readings in Scripture. The horn of my salvation is just uh, a, a phrase that refers to the exaltation uh, of, of that, that act, that saving act. I have been saved from my enemies. There's that word saved again. Praise be to my rock. Now notice what the psalmist does. He goes from rock, small r, to rock, capital R. What does that mean? When we talk about rock, small r, we're still talking about a noun, but we're not talking about a proper noun. When we capitalize it now, we're talking about person, place, or thing, but not thing in any generic sense. We're talking about now person. Praise be not to my rock, as in stone, but my rock, the one who saves me. Exalted be God my Savior, lifted up, may he be, who saves me. There's that word again. I've been saved, saves me, uh, deliverer. These are all words that describe what is happening or who God is in this. Saves me from my enemies, therefore will I praise you. I will sing the praises of your name. There's that parallelism that's so common in Hebrew poetry, him. Now the, the, the total psalm is different than this, and it talks about deliverance from enemies and specific acts of God as he deals with enemies. But I didn't want to focus on that today. When Peter is asked who Jesus is, he makes a confession. Do you remember what he says to Jesus? I remember it in the King James, right, Mel? Isn't that what we memorized in? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, on this rock I will build my kingdom. Now, some people think Peter's the rock because Petros means stone and so forth. But it's not the stone, Peter, that the kingdom of God is going to be built on. It's the stone of the confession. Thou art the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the one. You are the rock. Jesus describes the stone the builders rejected, and it has become a stumbling block. Jesus describes the stone that becomes the cornerstone, the most important keystone, if you will, of an arch or a building. This is the rock. And so our psalmist anticipates, it's prophetic, Jesus who's coming, our strength, our fortress, our deliverer, our refuge, the horn of our salvation, our shield, the one who saves us, our deliverer, our rock. In our Old Testament reading in Malachi, we get a slightly different read on Jesus, I will send my messenger, who might that have been, who will prepare the way before me? John the Baptist, good, yeah. John comes before Jesus as we see in our gospel reading. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord whom you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Acid and lye. 
He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. What is Malachi talking about? This again, New Testament authors and Christians throughout the centuries have applied to Christ. The messenger is John the Baptist, and the Lord we are seeking is the Messiah. The one that we have anticipated and desired is the coming king. Suddenly, the Lord whom you are seeking will come to his temple. And when he comes to his temple, his throne room, his palace, if you will, he comes not as one meek, per se, or mild, but as one who refines and judges. Now, this is interesting because this is not related to our childhood fantasies or visions of who Jesus is. With all due respect to our Sabbath school teachers, and you are wonderful, and our children are fabulous, when we put a felt image of a brown-haired Jesus with his hair down and his robes on, and he looks kind of effeminate, and he's just sort of there, we get this certain kind of image of Jesus, don't we? Maybe you grew up in an Afrocentric church and you had uh, black images of Jesus. Or maybe you grew up in an Asian-centric church and you had uh, a Christ with Asian features that you looked at in these felts or images. I don't know what you grew up with. But we get this idea of Jesus from these childhood stories and pictures And we forget the coming king who has come to separate wheat and chaff, chaff, sheep and goats, and to judge and to purify. So one of the things the Messiah is about, one of the things our Jesus is about, as we think about his centrality in our life, is he doesn't just come as this sort of, forgive me for saying it this way, but sort of wimpy figure who wanders around saying interesting things. He's this incredibly powerful person, even in human form. Incredibly possessed of the graces of his Father God. Incredibly aware, incredibly alive, and incredibly human. Which means that in this particular instance, he's incredibly male, strong, clear, insightful, decisive, powerful. Jesus comes not as a wimpy figure, not as somebody for us to just dismiss as a friend or a peer or a colleague. Jesus is human, but he's not human in the same way. Well, he is, but he's not human in the same way that we are in the sense that he is born of spirit as well as flesh. He's not human in the sense that we are and that he has come straight from the Father, from heaven, He's not human in the sense that we are, in the sense that he comes as a refiner, as a purifier, as one who will judge the world. I was born in sin, and in sin I'll die. Unredeemed and unrepentant, I have no life ahead of me. Ruin is my lot. Death is my eventuality. But Christ comes to bring about a different order, and I think we forget this. I think in our readings and in our familiarity, we lose track of the glory and greatness of the one who comes. He comes suddenly to his temple, a messenger of covenant, and he fulfills that covenant in a way that none of us ever could. All Israel ever did, if you read the stories of the Old Testament, was break the covenant again and again and again and again. The story of Israel is a story of human failure and God's grace and mercy. It's also a story of God's judgment and dividing and wooing. It's a story of God acting among a people. And while we may appropriate that story differently today, while we may privilege different sections of it, the invitation is coming to you to read this in its totality, to get a grip on what the sacred text brings us as a total picture of Jesus, and then to begin to think about the way in which we experience him today. Who can endure the day of his coming? 
What does Malachi mean? He came as a baby in Bethlehem. What was there to endure? Who can stand when he appears? There was a star, angels singing in the heavens, and the shepherds were afraid. Who is this refiner's fire or launderer's soap? It's not the babe of Bethlehem. It's the Messiah and King. And it's the one who comes again to judge the world for the last time. The one who refines and purifies us in character now and the one who separates the dross from the gold in judgment at the end of time. When we apprehend this, And when we allow Christ to to do the work in our lives that he wants to do, because relationship implies change. I just introduced Ralph to you a little bit ago. There is a man who, because of our relationship and our experience together and his mentoring and example, taught me things that are now part of who I am. I'm changed as a result of the experience of being in his direction for a year plus. And many of you know that experience. And when we're in relationship with Christ, it isn't that he doesn't love us. It isn't that he doesn't want us. It isn't that he doesn't care about us in the state that we are. But he will not leave you where where he found you. He will not leave you where he found you. He is the righteous one and you are not. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to say you're a worm or worthless. I'm just simply saying he's the righteous one and we're not. And when we have living encounter in relationship with him, it is not a relationship of neutrality. It's a relationship of refinement and that stinks sometimes. There are times I will be candid with you in my spiritual experience when I've said to God, enough for a while. I've made enough progress to last me for a while. I'm not really very interested at the moment at much more character refinement. I'm not sure I can take it. Are you shocked? Maybe some of you have said the same. Maybe some of you just aren't that honest with God. You just kind of turn your shoulder and go your own way. It's painful sometimes to confront the aspects of ourselves that need to be purged, that need to be cleansed, that need to be eliminated from our characters, our personalities, our lives, our choices, our menus. It's difficult. It's painful. It's a struggle sometimes. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes grace comes to us in unbelievable ways and we're relieved of something like that. And praise God. But we are caught in that. And when we are in true relationship with God and true relationship with Christ, we can't ignore this aspect of who he comes and claims to be. The gospel reading, Matthew. We read the words of John the Baptist, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up his chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Well, this is at least three sermons, right? At least. This passage. So I'm sorry to do this to you. This is kind of a quick... This is a tapas sermon. You get a little plate of something. You don't get the full... The full, we're having tapas today, okay? Don't like this, there's always potluck, and you can stick to one or two main courses, but here we go. I just want to hit this because I think it's, it's worth 
kind of looking at the images that we're talking about. First of all, we have John the Baptist, who is the most powerful prophet at the time of Christ. People see him as a prophet. He's understood. He's a Nazarite. He's taken Nazarite vows. He's a prophet. He's a voice in the wilderness. He's speaking to powers that be, including tetrarchs and rulers in secular places. He immediately recognizes his cousin as one who is more powerful than I, and this is a cultural phenomenon of great import to pay attention to because John was the older, and in cultures like Jewish culture, ancient Mesopotamian cultures, if you're the younger, you're the inferior. The older is always the superior. The older is always the heir. John puts himself in a, in a inferior position to Jesus immediately, even though he supersedes him and is older. He doesn't just say he's more powerful. He declares his unworthiness to even address him at the level of his feet, which is the level of a slave. Slaves dealt with feet. This is what we see in the upper room with Jesus washing the disciples' teeth. They, they didn't have a goyim for the evening. They did not have their Passover goyim, and Jesus steps up and acts as a servant. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire, not just water. And now we're talking about more than elements, too. That fire echoes our Malachi text. Here is the refiner's fire. He's baptizing us not just with something that will wash our bodies, water, but with Holy Spirit presence and a refiner's fire. Again, the idea that that which is impure will be burned away and that which is true and pure will remain. The second image is that of separating wheat from chaff, harvest from waste. The waste is burnt and the harvest gathered to the barn. It's a judgment image. It's an image that comes to us of the final outcome. Jesus does this to fulfill righteousness, but we've talked before about how important this event was for Jesus as well, because he needed two witnesses to begin to form his own school. He was a rabbi, and John the Baptist was one, and the voice of the Father was the other. We get a glimpse into the social reality that surrounds Jesus Christ as a man on earth as he comes up out of this water, Father, Son, and Spirit. And what a beautiful image it is. And then we get to our New Testament reading. The gift is not like the trespass. Paul's arguments sometimes loop around. They seem a little convoluted. They can be kind of challenging. You just think, when is this guy going to quit writing? It's a nice way of saying shut up. I love Paul. And I think he... he he really does an incredible job of nuancing things sometimes, but I have to admit even I have to look at it a bit. Here his basic argument is pretty straightforward. It's double meaning, but it's straightforward. The first meaning is that through Adam, that is to say humankind, sin enters the earth. One choice, eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, disobeying God. Through that one act, sin and death enter not just for Adam and Eve, but for humankind for the foreseeable future. That's Paul's argument. So it's one man's choice that brings sin and death, but it's also the choice itself. Through one sin, death reigned. Through one act of trespass, death now reigns. That's the power of sin. But Paul wants to make the statement about the exceeding greatness of Jesus Christ. And so he says, For if many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Exceeding greatness. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. So now in one act, you have the death of humankind. In one human pair, you have 
the introduction of sin and death for all. But now in the one man, Jesus Christ, you don't just have trespass for dress, trespass, death for death. Through the one man, Jesus Christ, all trespasses of humanity are now conquered. That's how much more powerful grace is than sin. Through the one man, not the early, the, not the Adamic couple who brought sin into the world, but through the one righteous man, Jesus Christ, justification comes not just against the trespasses, but against the sins of all of humanity. We live in a world with how many people now? What's the total? Seven billion? Is that what we're at? Roughly? Somewhere between seven and eight billion, I think, is where we're at right now. Now you say, let's say you are a really good person and you only sin once a day. And that's true for all humanity. All humanity only sins maybe once a day, let's say. So that's only 365 sins in a given year. Now do 365 times 7 billion. That's just one year. Now let's try to go backward in time a little bit. I mean, we're not talking about one order of magnitude greater. I want you to hear what Paul's argument is. He's not just talking about, you know, one to the one-th power or one to the second power or two to the second, whatever the multiplication ends up being there. He's talking about the greatness of God is so many multitudes of magnitudes greater than the sin problem that we can't comprehend it. That's who Jesus is. Jesus isn't up to forgiving the one man of the one sin. He's up to forgiving every sin that's ever been convict, uh, committed. And he's up to, in that death, atoning for all of the sin that's ever been, ever been committed. And in his righteousness and in his grace and in his mercy, he's so superseded the sins of humanity that he can take on the whole of humanity against himself. That's the greatness that Paul is arguing for. For if by the trespass, verse 17 of the one man, death reigned throughout the one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ? If that's not center, I don't know what is. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Another way of saying that is be revealed. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. That's exponential increase, mathematically exponential. So that just as sin reigned in death, so grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is the key. Well, we could talk for hours more about passages that illuminate some aspect of the centrality of Christ. But if you are going to journey with God, my friends, this is the Christ we must know. Not just the Christ of our childhood. Not just the Christ of the fuzzy felts. Not just the Christ of the artist's renderings and the children sitting on his knee. We worship, adore, emulate, study, sit with, pray to an amazing God of un incomprehensible power and grace and love who's made himself available to us in the likeness of us in the person of Jesus Christ. And that needs to be the center of our faith. So my apologies today if this has been a boring review of everything you already knew. My apologies today if in talking about this, it's just, oh yeah, another sermon on love and grace. I hope you haven't heard it that way. I hope you've heard it as a clarion call for a mature faith that understands what Christianity and Christian faith is really about. It is about learning to journey with this God revealed in Christ who is more amazing and wondrous 
and capable and maybe in a small way frightening and marvelous and powerful and gracious and good than we might ever, ever know.